I knew my strength was declining, my appetite had failed, and I was grown listless and desponding, and if, indeed, he could never care for me, and I could never see him more, if I was forbidden to minister to his happiness, forbidden, forever, to taste the joys of love, to bless and to be blessed, then life must be a burden, and if my heavenly Father would call me away, I should be glad to rest. But it would not do to die and leave my mother, selfish, unworthy daughter, to forget her for a moment. Was not her happiness committed in a great measure to my charge, and the welfare of our young pupils too? Should I shrink from the work that God had set before me, because it was not fitted to my taste? Did not he know best what I should do, and where I ought to labour? And should I long to quit his service before I had finished my task, and expect to enter into his rest, without having laboured to earn it? No, by his help I will arise and address myself diligently to my appointed duty. If happiness in this world is not for me, I will endeavour to promote the welfare of those around me, and my reward shall be hereafter. So said I in my heart, and from that hour I only permitted my thoughts to wander to Edward Weston, or at least to dwell upon him now and then, as a treat for rare occasions. And whether it was really the approach of summer, or the effect of these good resolutions, or the lapse of time, or altogether tranquillity of mind was soon restored, and bodily health and vigour begun likewise, slowly but surely, to return. Early in June I received a letter from Lady Ashby, late Miss Murray. She had written to me twice or thrice before, from the different stages of her bridal tour, always in good spirits, and professing to be very happy. I wondered every time that she had not forgotten me, in the midst of so much gaiety and variety of scene. At length, however, there was a pause, and it seemed she had forgotten me, for upwards of seven months passed away, and no letter. Of course I did not break my heart about that, though I often wondered how she was getting on, and when this last epistle so unexpectedly arrived, I was glad enough to receive it. It was dated from Ashby Park, where she was come to settle at last having previously divided her time between the continent and the metropolis. She made many apologies for having neglected me so long, assured me she had not forgotten me, and had often intended to write, etc., etc., but had always been prevented by something. She acknowledged that she had been leading a very dissipated life, and I should think her very wicked and very thoughtless, but, notwithstanding that, she thought a great deal, and among other things, that she should vastly like to see me. We have been several days here already, wrote she. We have not a single friend with us, and are likely to be very dull. You know I never had a fancy for living with my husband like two turtles in a nest, where he the most delightful creature that ever wore a coat, so do take pity upon me and come. I suppose your midsummer holidays commence in June, the same as other people's. Therefore you cannot plead want of time, and you must and shall come. In fact, I shall die if you don't. I want you to visit me as a friend, and stay a long time. There is nobody with me, as I told you before, but Sir Thomas and old Lady Ashby. But you needn't mind them. They'll trouble us but little with their company. And you shall have a room to yourself, whenever you like to retire to it, and plenty of books to read when my company is not sufficiently amusing. 
I forget whether you like babies. If you do, you may have the pleasure of seeing mine. The most charming child in the world, no doubt, and all the more so that I am not troubled with nursing it. I was determined I wouldn't be bothered with that. Unfortunately, it is a girl, and Sir Thomas has never forgiven me. But, however, if you will only come, I promise you shall be its governess as soon as it can speak, and you shall bring it up in the way it should go, and make a better woman of it than its mamma. And you shall see my poodle too, a splendid little charmer, imported from Paris, and two fine Italian paintings of great value. I forget the artist. Doubtless you will be able to discover prodigious beauties in them, which you must point out to me, as I only admire by hearsay and many elegant curiosities besides, which I purchased at Rome and elsewhere. And finally, you shall see my new home, the splendid house and grounds I used to covet so greatly. Alas! how far the promise of anticipation exceeds the pleasure of possession. There's a fine sentiment. I assure you I am become quite a grave old matron. Pray come, if it be only to witness the wonderful change. Write by return of post, and tell me when your vacation commences, and say that you will come the day after, and stay till the day before it closes in mercy to. Yours affectionately, Rosalie Ashby. I showed this strange epistle to my mother, and consulted her on what I ought to do. She advised me to go, and I went, willing enough to see Lady Ashby and her baby too, and to do anything I could to benefit her, by consolation or advice, for I imagined she must be unhappy, or she would not have applied me thus, but feeling, as may readily be conceived, that, in accepting the invitation, I made a great sacrifice for her, and did violence to my feelings in many ways. Instead of being delighted with the honourable distinction of being entreated by the baronet's lady to visit her as a friend, however, I determined my visit should be only for a few days at most, and will not deny that I derived some consolation from the idea that, as Ashby Park was not very far from Horton, I might possibly see Mr. Weston, or at least hear something about him. End of chapter 21